Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to continue our conversation on attachment. For those of you who are able to attend the conference, the APSATS 2024 conference, it was amazing. And there were some really good presentations there. And Alana, you said one of them used this tool and you were like, we got to talk about this. We got to include this in our attachment. Do you remember which presentation that was? Because I don't remember. Yeah, it was on the professional day and it was Jessica and Eric Edens. And really, it was on one of their slides. They didn't go into too much depth in it. But Sue Johnson and her work, she teaches this in EFT and I had totally forgotten about it. And I remember the first time I heard it being like, oh my goodness, there's so much to this. And then again, when they referenced it, I was like, ah, I had totally forgotten about this tool. So we're going to bring it to you today because it teaches a lot about what attachment is at its root and how it shows up in childhood and in our current relationship. I loved it too. And when I was going through it, I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> and it just makes sense to where this tool can be used. I, th I think let's start with that is that we're going to offer this tool and <laughs> we want to remind everybody that especially the model that AppSats uses, multi-dimensional part of trauma model, has three phases. And the first one is safety and stability. And so if there is no safety and stability in your relationship and your environment right now, that's how you're showing up today, then that is your focus. And this is going to be something really useful for you to hold on to and know what, number one, you can have <laughs> when healthy is working in the relationship. But also, I think this is a great tool for you to also apply to yourself right now. So hold on to this. But if we're talking relationally, and there is not safety, if you're in phase one, then please don't try to attempt to create this in the relationship. It can cause additional trauma and experiences that I know you all don't want. So just want to put that disclaimer out there. This tool really is for phase two and three, and we use it differently in each one. But it's the acronym A is accessible, R is responsive, and E is engaged. So it's R, you there for me. And that's how she's phrased it. So let's go through each one. I think that's good. That question, are you there for me, especially in times of need? is one of the main factors we look at when we're assessing for people for attachment injuries in childhood or we're just looking at their current relationship. I'm, I'm looking through that lens of in those times of distress, are those people available? Are they available to you? And so I love taking this overall idea of, are you there for me? But then understanding what it actually means to be there. Because what I see a lot is partners who are engaging in this work really do want to know and understand on what healthy looks like and what it means to be there for somebody, but often don't have the tools or the knowledge. So having this type of psychoeducation that says, hey, yeah, are you there means you are accessible, you're responsive, you're engaged, all of a sudden gives us something that we can check ourselves and work towards. I love that you said that. Because even in my divorce ladies or ladies who are considering divorce, it is so important to understand what healthy looks like and to what you have a right to. One thing I just want to add is you have a right in your relationship to expect your partner to be accessible, responsive, and engaged. It is not asking too much. This isn't demanding. This is relational. This is how we protect the relationship. Let's just go ahead and dive into to the acronym here. So are you there for me? And she says, this is a question that every couple in the world asks each other. Is, are you going to be there for me? Let's go to the early childhood part of this as a parent. Yeah. Yeah. When you're a little person, you're still wondering and wanting your person to be there for you. So one of the questions I'll ask in an attachment history is who were the people that you went to or person and were they always there for you? And then I'll say, if they weren't, how did you seek that comfort? And so to be accessible, having 
I'll start with a parent. Having a parent or a caregiver be accessible to you means that they are available and they can be reached when you need them. So if I have a parent who is working and lots of us are working, well, to be accessible means that my kids can, if there's an emergency, they can still call me. I am accessible to them. That while even though I'm at work, if my daughter calls me, and this actually happened the other day, she got in a fender bender in the school parking lot. She called me in tears. I, well, and that's what I do with it is my responsiveness, but she can send me a text and it will come through to me because I am accessible to my children in those times of need. So that right there, knowing that that person is available to be reached. So yeah, we can take this really clearly in now to our intimate partner relationships. Is that person available and can you be reached when you need them? The way my brain's working is let's stay with accessible and now to the partnership. So for example, when you are navigating back towards the relationship, they are working on their recovery. You're working on yours, but you're also starting to lean in. You're looking more for the behavior to align with the mouth now with the addict. Being accessible here, I'm going to speak for the betrayed partner. The betrayed partner is going to look to the betrayer. I am triggered. And are you accessible to either comfort, hold space, or if I am triggered, do you flee or throw it back in my face? The fight. What is their response? Because phase two is really that couple grieving, grieving the relationship together, but starting to lean back in. Part of a fair recovery through the lens of EFT is being able to come to a shared meaning and a shared story together, a shared understanding, which means there needs to be a certain level of accessibility that you can go to them and talk to them. And even being accessible is not just in the hard, but in the excited. I think of sometimes where I'll work with partners and they're so excited about something, but don't really feel like they can go to their partner and share, I got this big win at work or my little one just did this and wanting to go share that, but that person really isn't accessible. They're not open and available and accessible could mean that they're sitting there on their phone and they're numbed out and they're shut out to you. I think of people who have addictions. I'll start with addictions and then go into affairs separately, but people who have addictions If they're always numbed out and they're emotionally shut down, they're not going to be accessible. Or if we have somebody who is in an affair, now we have this competing attachment and their heart and their brain is with somebody else. They're not accessible to you. And so you can see how it sounds so basic, but the importance of being accessible when you need them or to bring those emotions to. And you can feel it. You can feel it in your core when that person is there, but not there. And I, I realized early on that I have a hyper attunement to that, that when I want to show up and take up space, I can sense very quickly when someone is not accessible and they might physically be standing there, but they're not there. You can sense it you can feel it. And then where attachment comes in is early on, what did I learn to do at that point? What role did I absorb? What thoughts do I believe about myself when I realize that that person isn't accessible? And that's the deeper level work of attachment that you want to start looking at. So for example, mine was you're being too much, (laughs) right? You're too much for this person. So take it down a notch. So that just meant stay quiet, stay silent, and be small. And I got really good at knowing how to make other people feel big because Mm -hmm. that kept them engaged with me. So that's kind of how this all plays into attachment too. So I just had a thought. If you're a betrayed partner and you're listening to this and you're thinking about yourself as a parent and you are having, oh shit moment. Sorry, I rarely swear on here, though I do love to swear. I'll admit that. But if you're having that type of moment and you're going, I am not emotionally accessible to my kids. 
I am in so much trauma, I can barely function. I am not emotionally accessible in the way that I want to. I just want to give you some grace because that is very real. There was a season that I was not emotionally accessible to to anybody or anything. And just knowing that I just needed that season to heal. And as soon as I could, I was again. And there were pieces that, yeah, they had some healing and I had some healing and that's okay. And if you are a partner who has betrayed, it is not your healing partner's responsibility right now to show up with these. This, are you there for me? The answer is no. I'm sorry, they're not going to be there for you right now because right now their responsibility is to heal. Talking about yeah. phase two. Yeah. Our goal is to heal enough so then we can start helping both partners be there for each other. But there will be a season where they absolutely might not be accessible, responsive, or engaged. Right. And that is appropriate for the level of healing that we're in. Yes. And for mamas, go back and listen to, I don't even know how long ago, but we did a whole series on mama trauma and mm -hmm. talked about this very thing. So go back and, and re-listen to those, some of the tools that we share there as well. The next one is responsiveness. This is if you're finding that your partner is accessible, then the other step in order to start feeling that connection is, is our partner responsive to your emotions? This is, again, why I see this in phase two, because the betrayer is practicing that empathy, learning how to be not only cognitively empathetic, but affectively empathetic as well. Will you slow that down right there? Because that concept, I think, is so important. Will you just explain what you mean by that? Yes, you can also go to Brene Brown's work, Atlas of the Heart, because she breaks this down even more. But essentially, the cognitive is just thinking. Cognitive is just the thinking brain. And so this is where I see a lot of men who are trying to learn empathy. They learn the right words to say. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I can see why you would feel that way, right? So they're saying and thinking the words of empathy. But the feeling, the emotion, the affect, affect is what we call emotion and how it shows up in your body. That isn't there. And you know the difference. You know when someone is just spouting off words versus someone that really can effectively support you and respond to what you're experiencing. And so that's why this responsiveness is so important. Because we want to know that we matter to our person and that our worries and concerns and emotions and cares and pain triggers, all of it matters. Love that word. It matters. So for when that one person is having an embodied experience of attunement versus I'm thinking about and cognitively giving you that empathy. Yeah. Thank you for slowing that down because I see so many people get stuck there that I think that's just really important to highlight the difference. So when you are really embodied in that attunement, you're responsive right there. So in phase two, we're working on betrayer, having some of that empathy. Now phase three, this is where both partners are going to learn to be responsive and problem solve together. I think this is where some of that psychological intimacy starts to come in too. If I'm feeling this way and I'm feeling this way, how can we meet each other's needs? Let's figure out what that looks like so we can both get our needs met. And so we're taking a problem and we're breaking it apart. And we're figuring out how to resolve that together. That could only happen when we have some responsiveness to what the other person needs, wants, desires, hopes. Even if it's just for what are we doing on Saturday, <laughs> right? I want to clean out the garage. Well, I want to go to the farmer's market. We want to get in and respond to the other person's thoughts and needs and emotions. And that's how you would start to lean into that when you are reintegrating into the relationship back in, in phase three. And I'll just put out there, the longer we haven't been doing this as a betrayed partner, this scarier it can feel to lean into that, to start attuning, 
to start letting yourself see their needs and their desires and where they are at. And so feeling discomfort in that process is normal and expected. Absolutely. And this is where diving deeper into understanding your attachment wounds with this. It's when I notice that someone isn't responding, then what message did I absorb? What message does this part tell me? And that might be, I did something wrong. Like we talked about in the example last week, Alana, where early on in our relationship, if you weren't responsive, What was the message that I told myself? I must have done something wrong. I'm going to mess up this friendship. That's my work to observe and notice. And when I can work on that and heal that and comfort myself and respond, me, my higher self, respond to that part, then I can lean in to a deeper level of relationship with you. Because if you don't respond, I'm not attached to that. That's where some of the deeper work looks like with attachment. Thank you for saying this because yes, we, each of us as individuals have our own attachment work to do. So to truly be able to be responsive, we have to know what our own attachment longings are, what our attachment triggers are and do our work around that. And both individuals need to do that Because when we are in a relationship and they're our primary attachment, we are going to be triggering each other's attachment fears and longings all of the time. And it happens in a nanosecond. Our body picks up those alarm signals long before our brain even does. And so if we don't take the time, each side take the time to do this work, we really are setting ourselves up for so much more, I'm trying to look for the right word, like pain, discomfort, challenges. Triggering each other's attachment stuff is just part of being human. But the more work we do around it and the more understanding we have around it, the less we get thrown into these spirals of chaos. Yeah, at least for me, my experience is the less I'm re-injuring myself in a lot of ways. Mm Mm-hmm. And your partner, right? Because then our protectors come out. Exactly. That's why in phase one and two, we are still doing a lot of that individual work. This is also why jumping into couples is going to re-injure. You can see how now why there's more potential for that re-injury when we're doing the couples too early, too soon without the individual work and understanding around some of these attachments. The last one is engagement. So again, it's the last step to R-A-R-E, are you there for me? So not only do partners need to be accessible and respond to each other, but they need to be engaged in the conversation and create that true emotional connection. And I can just hear all the betrayed partners just going, yes, (laughs) exactly. Because how often is the betrayer showing up in that checklist sort of way? but not really still being vulnerable or not really getting engaged in that conversation. For example, asking follow-up questions. I was working with a a gentleman the other day when we were talking about this, like you did a great job at hearing her and validating her as to where she's at, but then you shut down, went into victim mode and there was no follow-up. There was no engagement. And so she made meaning of it You stayed in victim and then you both went to your separate islands again. So what does engagement look like? Well, again, this is why phase two, phase three requires the vulnerability, the authenticity, the interest. I look at it like, and this is just my drastic difference between my first relationship to now, the level of engagement that my husband offers now of that curiosity Asking follow-up question, I will be honest, was not used to that. I sort of took it as a bad thing. He started asking follow-up questions about my experience, and I'd be like, why are you digging? Why are you nitpicking? My brain associated that with something so negative because I didn't know what it felt like to have someone engage and be interested and curious about me. 
about my life, my interests. That was super foreign. So I just want to put it out there. This is going to feel weird. And you might absorb that. And that goes to my attachment runes, the meaning that I gave that and what I made that mean. But once I started looking at that and going, oh, okay, this makes sense why I'm taking it that way. All right. Now, am I engaging? Am I asking questions? Getting curious about his experience. That's level three work right there. I, I take this back to childhood. And I invite you to think about, was there a time in your childhood that you had something where your parent was really engaged? in a good way, maybe something you're really excited about or something you were really hurt about. And what did it feel like to have that person engaged? And maybe you didn't, and that question's really painful. But if you did, think about that. And when I hear engagement, I think about this one time, I was standing in the kitchen and I was doing something on my phone. It was work-related and my son came in and he was really excited about something with Pokemon. I don't love Pokemon. I don't find them overly interesting. But he was telling me about how this one thing grows into this other thing. And he was so excited. And I was available. He was telling me all about it. I was responding to him. But I don't know what I was responding to. I know how to respond and go, oh, uh uh-huh. Oh, it was like that? Really? My heart? I was not engaged. I was still on my phone. I was multitasking. And I don't know why this is really ingrained in my brain that I did this, but I feel remorse for it because the child knows when I am engaged. And even though he was willing to take what he could get because he was so excited, part of me goes, okay, yes, I hit those first two, but me not being engaged caused some damage there. And I think about my husband and he'll do this thing where he'll answer me. And I'm like, did you even hear what I just asked? Because that answer was like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, well, what did you just say? Yeah, sure, too. You responded, you're available, but you are not engaged right now in this conversation. So this level of being engaged, I think, goes back to the word attunement of are you emotionally and mentally and physically present right there? Are you engaged with what that other person is saying and sharing? it's a deeper level of presence. It's such a great example. And, and thank you for your vulnerability and sharing that because I think that really just set up the point here so beautifully and the difference and how we can maybe show up in A and R, but not the E. And it really is all three. Are you available? It needs to have all three there. And the other thing that came up for me is you were sharing that experience, which again, I think so many of us can relate to. So thank you. But when you notice, let's just say we're in maybe phase two, but phase three, especially if you notice your partner isn't engaged, part of being relational is saying, hey, I'm noticing that you're not maybe really engaged. Is this a good time to bring this up? That's one thing that I have been practicing on doing better at because Scott is always available and he is always great at being responsive. So I kind of just will throw myself into a conversation with him and just assume that he is going to be engaged. And when I stop and go, is this a good time actually for you to hear this? Do you want to hear this? And he's like, actually, no. And then he will come back to me later and say, okay, now I am ready because he can be more engaged in hearing the feedback and having more of that deeper connection. And so I think if you're in this space and you're like, gosh, I am noticing he's not engaged. And then you want to go to your island. That is where the attachment stuff comes in. So secure attachment is leaning in and saying, I'm noticing you're not engaged. Secure attachment is not being afraid to show up that way. And then on the reverse, it's not being afraid to say, actually, no, I do have a lot on my mind. Can I get back to you? And then you better get back to the <laughs> I think that's a lot of how this, this happens just in a day-to-day. Mm-hmm. Because not trying to set this up as a checklist to be perfect at. It, it's okay to give some grace and space for you not to be perfect at it. In, 
a hundred percent engagement because I can also hear betrayed partners going, he's not engaged. <laughs> so, you know, I'm out. Why? Get curious. Why? Give each other an opportunity to step into that engagement. I think right there, that tool just by itself stands on its own two feet. I I literally have it on a sticky note on my desk to remind me as a mother that I want to be that type of parent. And so that's my reminder to myself. And thank you, Jessica and Eric, for putting that in their presentation to remind me of this tool. As with any tool we give you, do not expect perfection the second you learn it. It's just something that we're bringing awareness around and we're learning and growing. And the podcasts are just psychoeducation. They're just learning. And then what you do with that, take it, process it, have awareness around it, learn, grow, and keep moving. So thank you for hanging out with Amy and I this week. And as always, we look forward to seeing you next week. No matter where you're at in your journey, here's something that I want you to consider as well. Practicing this acronym, A-R-E, are you there for me, but for yourself? Are you accessible to you? Meaning when something is upsetting or exciting, do you take a moment to connect with you? Do you console yourself, express your emotions clearly? That can be just even through journaling, but are you accessible to you? And then our responsiveness, do you respond to your emotions with kindness, with compassion, with empathy, or do you shut down, numb out, and not respond to your beautiful emotions that are coming up? And then engagement, are you engaged with you? Are you there for you? Just like we talked about in a partnership, asking more questions, getting more curious, do you do this with you and for yourself? Or do you stay quiet? Do you pull away and withdraw from yourself? Rather than asking yourself more questions, getting more curious, validating your own emotions, feeling that empathy for you and parts of you in that moment. Learning how to do this for yourself is absolutely step one in healing from betrayal. And it's why I created my Believing in You coaching program, because this is what we do. We dive in and get curious and learn how to connect and trust and believe and love ourselves first at the deepest level. Click the link in the show notes to find out more or head over to chooserecoveryservices.com. They're afternoon and evening spots. These women are amazing and doing incredible work as they are gaining more awareness into themselves and believing in themselves again. You can do this too by choosing to heal, choosing recovery, and choosing you. Take care, everybody.